All right. Okay, I'm Christoph now, pastoral associate here at St. Perpetua's. Mark McMahon, St. Uh, John Vianney, Walnut Creek. Mary Fenelon, Mount Diablo Unitarian Universalist Church in Walnut Creek. Laura Sanchez, San Ramon Valley United Methodist, Alamo. Elizabeth Robinson, Orinda Community Church. Doug Leach, Danville Congregational Church. Leslie Gleason, Trinity Center. Harry Veering, Hope Solutions. Yeah. I'm sorry, Alice, can you say it again? Um, Alice Clark, First Congregational Church of Berkeley. Great. Elizabeth Nardi, Judy Schumann, uh, Winter Nights, Family Shelter. Jan Warren, Lafayette Christian Church. Gabriella Perez, I'm new to the group. I'm with Covia's Community Services, specifically the Home Match Contra Costa team. Julie Clemens, Shelter Inc. I think that's everybody. One more. Uh, Alex Worth, Policy Associate at East Bay Housing Organizations. Okay. Thanks, Alex. All right. Um, Meditation? I have Anyone? something that goes along with uh, what's happening and forcing us to meet like this. Again, I'd encourage <laughs> you, uh, if you're not talking, please mute yourself. Um, and then when you want to say something, uh, unmute yourself. That makes it a lot easier and avoid the background noise. Let's remember, even though we're not physically present, gathered, we are in the holy presence of God. Almighty and merciful God, who shows your love to all creation, we come before you asking for a quick control of the coronavirus currently ravaging our world. Hear graciously the prayers we make for those affected by the virus in various parts of the world. Grant healing to the sick, eternal life to the dead, and consolation to the bereaved families. We pray that an effective medicine to combat the sickness be speedily found. We pray for the relevant governments and health authorities that they take appropriate steps for the good of the people. Look upon us in your mercy and forgive us our failings. Amen. Amen. All right. So the first part uh, will be the notes from our. Oh. Oh, that must be the last meeting. It says in the agenda from from today's date. Okay, so accepting the notes from our last gathering. Um, I don't know if anybody has anything that he or she wants to add or change. If so, um, please let us know. Um, and I guess in this setting, I take silence as an acceptance of the notes from our last meeting, which is just fine because it works much better than with everybody speaking up. Um, okay. We have a new attendee, Christoph. Oh, that's right. I think Scott jumped in. Yeah, hey guys. Scott. Can I say who you are? <laughs> what was that? Just tell hey. us who you are real quick. So we, we did introductions before you joined us. Oh, I'm sorry. I was having trouble getting in. I am Scott. I'm a local pastor in Pleasant Hill, and I do um, work on the side with the homeless as much as I can. And I'm currently trying to push for getting homeless shelters placed at uh, places of faith on their campuses. Um, I've been working with the Pleasant Hill city government with that. Okay. And then we had Fran join us. Hi. And you all? I'm Fran Walsh, um, Walnut Creek United Methodist Church Extended Family Program. Great, thank you and welcome. We're up to 17 now. All right. <laughs> well, it's actually, that's good. We can accommodate as many people as possible. In, my, in our meeting room, we would have been getting pretty uh, cozy. Um, all right, 
let's see. Then I think there's a request that reports be written in, uh, submitted in written form. So that way um, it makes it easier for our note taker, Joan. Um, okay, Jamie, just in time, Jamie, because you were on the agenda. Can you hear me, Jamie? I can. All right. Uh, welcome, and you can tell us who you are, and then you can give us the homeless county homeless sure. services report. Okay. Um, yes. Let me just pull up my notes. Hold on one second. So I'm Jamie Jeanette with Health, Housing, and Homeless Services. Hi, everybody. Hey. Um, let me just pull up my notes to make sure I'm giving you all the info. Hold on one second. Sorry, it's been a back-to-back -back meeting kind of morning. Yeah, I know the feeling. You're familiar, yes. Uh, okay, hold on one second. And of course, I'm having technical difficulties. Give me one sec. While she's looking for that, let me jump in and say that uh, the county's homeless program sent out a, a, an advisory notice uh, just yesterday, or day before yesterday, I guess. Maybe it was Friday. Uh, with an update on what's going on. I'm sure Jamie's going to touch on those, yep. but I just wanted to acknowledge that you did send that out to the Continuum of Care, and it's a very good update. Good. Thank you. That was actually part of what I was trying to pull up. Um, so, oh, I'm having... There we go. Um, so, hello again, everyone. Um, just to, I can provide you with some updates. Um, so the one thing to know is that um, H3 Health, Housing, and Homeless Services is now activated in the incident command structure for the emergency response. So um, just big picture, one thing to know is that a lot of us have gotten pulled off of our regular work into um, helping manage some of that crisis. So if you're if you're reaching out to us for stuff, it might take a minute. Um, so we are working very actively with public health um, and a lot of the other county departments to kind of, to mobilize a response. Um, and one of the things we've done is developed a couple of different documents. And so one thing I can do is in the comments section is um, drop some links for people. So we've developed some um, guidelines for congregate facilities. So that's basically like shelters um, and also our care centers where essentially you have a, a bunch of people together in the same space. We have some guidelines for outreach providers um, and then a general community frequently asked questions document. So all of those are up on our website. Um, we are also having regular weekly uh, phone calls slash web meetings with um, all the providers just to provide updates and have opportunities to answer questions. Um, one of the big things that people have asked about because there's been a lot of uh, media coverage about it is sort of hotels and motels and what's happening with that. Um, and so as Doug said, the document that we sent out, um, the email that we sent out yesterday um, outlines it. Um, but essentially what we're doing right now is prioritizing. So we have all these people that are in shelter and in our community, because we've done a really good job prioritizing the most vulnerable people to go into shelter, that means we have a lot of vulnerable people sitting all in one place. And that's a real concern in case there's a positive case in the shelter. So what we've been doing over the last week is moving all of the most vulnerable people and working with Healthcare for the Homeless to identify um, sort of in terms of age and also underlying medical conditions. Who are the most vulnerable people in all the shelters around the county? and prioritizing moving those people out and putting them into hotel rooms um, with the idea that if they get COVID, they're more likely to have a real severe outcome. Um, we are also, if anybody is, um, have, is symptomatic and in the process of getting tested or has a positive test, they're also being placed in shelter right now, in, um, in hotel rooms right now. Um, and the other piece is our Concord shelter actually, um, so the county as a whole is working on setting what they're called um, alternate care sites, which is essentially um, sort of a, a auxiliary space for people to be um, for COVID positive people that don't require hospitalization. Um, so they're working on the Richmond Craneway is one site, but then our Concord shelter is actually another site that they're looking at. 
Um, and so we've been moving everybody out of the Concord shelter and the respite center. Um, and part of why they wanna use that space is because there is a medical clinic actually built into that building that's part of the respite center. So everybody in the Concord sites is getting moved out um, and we're prioritizing moving vulnerable people out of our other shelters um, at, at the time, for the time being. Um, we have our core outreach teams are, are out in the field and they're still doing, for the most part, their regular work. They're checking in on people, dropping off supplies. Um, they're working very closely with healthcare for the homeless um, to identify people that um, may have some medical needs, including needing testing for COVID. Um, CORE is not doing any transportation of any clients for any reason at this point um, for, you know, due to, to social distancing um, requirements. Um, but they are working very closely with Healthcare for the Homeless and, and once somebody, there's a whole set of protocols, which I can also link to, um, for providers that are trying to get their consumers tested, um, or if there's concerns about that, there's, there's a whole um, process now about how to do that. So we, um, I mean, you all may be having this experience, but for sure on this end, like the information is changing like almost by the half day. <laughs> so um, the other piece that's happened and part of why we haven't had a lot of communication coming out is um, all messaging now is needing to go through this whole incident command structure and kind of be vetted um, by the top um, communications folks before things go out. So uh, I know some like, Nonprofits and other agencies are doing sometimes even daily updates, and we're not able to do that. Um, so we're trying to hold, we're trying to do at least weekly emails where we're putting out all the information we can at once and trying to really work on updating um, all the documents. So that was a very quick update, but I'm, I'm happy to um, answer questions if I can, but hopefully that's a um, fairly, that's what I got for now. Uh, good. Good, thank you. So the good news is there's no, uh, nobody has po uh, tested positive yet so far among the, the guests, right? That's, oh, so that's the other thing I was gonna add is we, um, on the health services um, website, they're now um, having dashboards of the number of people tested, the number of people identified positive, the number of deaths, and we're working, um, to have also the number of like that data for the homeless population. Okay. So so that will be public information soon. They're just working on the mechanics behind the scene. What question? Um, where'd your little face go? She left. Oh, there you are. You moved. Um, so you can put those links up on our chat. Yeah, I'll do awesome. that while we're okay. When somebody else got, starts talking, I'll throw those in there. Got some new people on. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Mm -hmm. When is the Richmond Cramway site going to be activated? That I don't know. That's sort of above our above the H three process. But um, they the county has been putting out um, news releases and press releases as they have more official information to release. So when I, I'll put um, so one thing is if you're on social media, I highly recommend that you like Contra Costa Health Services. They've been putting out messaging every day. Um, but also I'll do a link to the COVID um, website, the county COVID website, and they'll, anytime there's a press release or anything like that, they'll put it up there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Jamie? All righty. Then we'll uh, go to the different cities. Any updates on Concord? Tenants' rights? Naval Weapon Station, et cetera. Anybody have any updates on Concord? Christoph, there's a question in the chat. Yeah, I, I, have, I have an update on the Concord Naval Weapon Station. The Concord City Council had a meeting about a month ago uh, in which they uh, basically turned down um, four demands that when our five point the master development the master developer was making of 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 concord and um and basically this uh you know refusal of the demands that lenar was making uh probably ends up meaning that um that lenar five point is walking away from the project so it's basically 
um, not going anywhere anytime soon. All right, that's not very promising. Um, I wasn't the um, Concord moratorium on evictions passed since we last met. Yeah, oh, sure. Yeah, that's certainly relevant to the story on, on uh, what's happening in Concord. The very next night, um, they met, city council met again and passed a, a moratorium on evictions. And that was definitely much better news from the housing uh, front than the and the um, disappearance of the Naval Weapons Station reuse project that was on the previous night. Thanks, Doug. Anything else uh, for Concord? Doug or Laura, do we have any idea what the next step is for, uh, for that project? Are they gonna look for another master developer? Uh, really, yeah, I'd have to say that the answer is in the long term, yes. But what the time frame is, gosh, who, who knows? Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, then moving on to Walnut Creek. Homeless task force, parking lot program, et cetera. Anybody have any updates on, on that? I'll give a brief one. Um, um, our last Walnut Creek uh, Homeless Task Force meeting, uh, we formed a subcommittee uh, to uh, find a way to put together some information to, to promote uh, people donating for the parking lot program in Walnut Creek. Uh, we're running out of funding, funding and uh, we need to um, get some additional funding. The program's uh, doing very well. They've housed some folks. They've uh, it's got 11 people in the, on the lot now, and there's a waiting list, and it's been very successful. Trinity Center itself has a, a nice write-up on their webpage um, about their uh, safe parking lot program, and they show the benefits and how they're measuring impacts. They have a donate button, and so if anyone has any uh, additional uh, good ideas about something, some way we could uh, reach out particularly to uh, Walnut Creek residents right now. Um, well, we're, we're all ears. Um, Jan, do you know, was, was any reason given for the, the increase from four people in the, in the program to 11 now? That, that's quite a rapid increase. Well, they did close the armory. Um, oh, right. So that's part of it. And then the other thing is, uh, you know, people are supposed to be sheltering in place and <laughs> they, they don't have any place to shelter in place. So that's. Yep, that's about right, Jan. She got it. All right, we have. Jan, you froze. Jan is frozen. All right. Until, I'm back. Uh oh, she's unfrozen. Okay. All right, that comes and goes like that. Sorry, I'm unstable, as all y'all know. Um, <laughs> uh, Leslie, I, I think you've given it to us before, but if we could, it would help be helpful to have stats for the the cost, daily cost, um, maybe beginning to end over this six week uh, six month trial period. The people we've helped get into housing, or the people we've uh, been able to uh, help with the parking lot program. Um, and some people want to know about, uh, I mean, you told us before about uh, how you might change the program to reduce some of the costs, but I don't think you promote any getting rid of our, uh, substituting our guards with uh, <laughs> the security people with volunteers, but you could correct me if I'm wrong on that. Um, and they also had a question about Trinity um, looks for car donations, and she's wondering if you get more car donations, will more will that mean more people would be interested in being in the program? If you have any info, I'll pass it along. To you. Well, we have Trinity Center as one of the agenda items, so yeah, okay. Well, this was all parking lot, but okay. 
Okay. Anything else on the parking lot program or homeless task force? Do you want me to answer those parking lot questions in the context of the Walnut Creek bigger picture? Sure. Thank okay. you. Okay. So um, right now, no, we're not thinking we need more car donations. That um, turned out to be more complicated than we thought, including some concerns about liabilities on Trinity Center's part. So yeah. that's not the rate limiting thing. It, it really is being able to have the money to provide on-site staffing, which we're hoping may be going forward, but we're not sure um, whether this is considered a substantial change or a minor change, but that staffing might not necessarily be a fully bonded professional security company, but would be staffing who would be on-site and be able to help um, create some hospitality and case management, sort of like at, um, Winter Nights Safe Parking Program, um, which apparently has been very successful. Mm -hmm. Right now it's costing about $2,000 a week for the security company, and that money goes quickly. We were able to get some modification of our original agreement with the city of Walnut Creek so that um, we can use all the funding that Walnut Creek made available to keep the program going. Um, and, I, did I answer all those questions about the safe parking program that you had? Did, did I get it? You there? Yeah. I, Are you all she there? Also had, she also had there? one about yeah. okay. on, ongoing projects. Do you see it as an ongoing project if we have the funding? Absolutely. Okay. Now more than ever, because it is a good way to stay in place. So. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All Thanks. right. Judy, I'd be interested in knowing is, is your how your safe parking program is going. Well, I can answer that right now. And by the way, can you hear me? You're breaking out. Can you hear me? Yes, but yes, you're breaking out. You. Oh my gosh. Well, I okay. I will I will talk very loud. Um, it, our parking lot program is going well. We have uh, six to seven individuals in, well, pr probably eight individuals in six, six cars. We open up the Oasis, which is our uh, day shelter, which we're not using, three times a week so they can have showers. And um, I just did some figuring. It costs us probably about $1,500 a week to run it because we do, do have staff and not, uh, we're not paying a security. Um, we're thinking about extending it because um, the, uh, we're through in April and our shelter will probably be closed in April. We're not sure um, how that's gonna work, um, but we're thinking of extending it. And um, the one problem that everybody is having is that um, we, we only open Monday, Wednesday, Friday for showers and at the Oasis and all the other days, um, they don't have any place to to cook uh, if they're cooking outside. They don't have any place to use the restroom because all of the parks are closed and all of the um, fast food places are closed. So um, uh, some some folks are working on some uh, porta potties, but. Um, I don't think that's come through yet. Oh, by the way, one of the things that happens is that that when people find out more about um, uh, it, the word gets around, then we get more folks, and it's not necessarily because they're sheltering in place. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, 
All right, anything else from other parts of the county? So I'd like to jump in here um, with um, uh, talking about uh, proposals for uh, eviction moratoriums or, you know, uh, um, one of the things that Jan sent out, which was uh, an attachment that I uh, sent to her and asked her to send out, it was uh, a letter um, to the Board of Supervisors. I think it was dated uh, March, wait, well, let me just call it off here. Uh, March 30th, a uh, letter dated March 30th to the Board of Supervisors and the County Administrator uh, with, on the subject of urgent action to preserve housing stability and protect tenants and small businesses affected by COVID-19. And I just wanted to make sure that this task force um, has this letter because um, Multi-Faith Action Coalition is one of 65 organizations that si signed on to this letter. Normally, um, this the Multi-Faith Action Coalition process for, for a letter like this would have gone through this task force first. Uh, but this draft, the, the, the sign-on letter that was being passed around and uh, with uh, invitation for organizations to sign on uh, came with a, with a, we had less than 24 hours to act on it. Um, the deadline for organizations to sign on was Monday the 30th, I guess. And, um, uh, no, Monday the 29th. And um, the, I could have that wrong, it was a Monday. Um, the, the, um, the deadline was 4 p.m. that Monday. Um, we didn't even get a text of the letter until uh, early Monday morning. So we basically went right to the steering committee for approval for this letter without having being able to take the time to go through the um, uh, task force. So just an apology for shortcutting the process of um, not involving the task force in a decision to sign on to this letter, but um, having go, getting past that uh, issue, um, just want you to be aware of what the letter asks for, that this is, um, there is a need for the county to take action on um, a countywide um, moratorium on evictions and, and possibly on uh, freezing rent increases as well. And this is a, of course, is a public health issue because uh, housing stability is a very strong determinant of, of health and uh, sending people out of their homes uh, in, in this shelter in place environment is just the wrong thing to do. So um, the good news is that several cities in Col uh, Contra Costa have passed their own uh, city rent um, uh, eviction moratorium ordinances. They include Concord, Pittsburgh, Antioch, Richmond, and El Cerrito, and maybe somebody knows of other ones that I didn't list there. And Pinol. And Pinol, great. Um, so the, but, but still, uh, the county hasn't taken action. And the reason action is really needed is that the governor's executive order of March 27th, uh, which has been talked about in the press as an eviction moratorium, isn't really an eviction moratorium. It's a moratorium on court action related to evictions. Uh, but, all, but other processes, uh, starting with the initial notification by a landlord that someone is being evicted, can still happen. And um, so the reason for the need for a county, county ordinance uh, has to do with the fact that the governor's order didn't go uh, far enough. Right. This topic will be on the Board of Supervisors agenda tomorrow morning. Uh, uh, the, the meeting starts at 9.30. Uh, people can tune in either by going to the, to the Supervisors Board, the county website for the Board of Supervisors, and uh, you can get streaming video through the, the county's uh, website, or you can tune in via um, local uh, CCTV channels. 
and um, you know, public comment uh, can be submitted uh, via a form on the Board of Supervisors website. Uh, and we were we we're encouraging people to uh, to make public comment to uh, to urge them to do take some action on this. Do you have that website handy that you could put in the chat box by any chance? Uh, I don't know if I can do that while this is happening, but we should follow up with uh, a um, uh, just before this meeting started, uh, I Jan and I both received from Melody Howe Weintraub a, a forwarding of a request for public comment that came from Mariana Moore of ensuring opportunity with talking points and everything like that. And I think the most effective thing to do would be to just forward that to the people on the task force list. Okay, sounds good. All right, thank hey, you. Doug. Doug, has the Board of Supervisors taken up this issue before or would this be the first time? So two weeks ago, the, at the last meeting with the Board of Supervisors, there were, I think somebody counted 98 public comments, um, including some of us, um, urging the supervisors to take action on a, such a moratorium. Mm. Um, and, uh, and this was at, at the same time that our 65 organization letter had just been submitted to the Board of Supervisors. So with that letter and with all the public comment, there was a lot of urging of them to take action, but it wasn't on the agenda for that um, meeting of the Board of Supervisors. The supervisors did discuss uh, whether to put something on the agenda for this meeting tomorrow, and rather than put, rather than direct staff to develop a potential ordinance, they just said, Let's just put it on as a discussion item on the agenda for tomorrow. And so, yeah, so they haven't taken any action. The only action they've taken is scheduled a discussion on it for uh, tomorrow's Board of Supervisors meeting. All righty. Um, let's see. Hope Solutions is next with uh, Carrie. Okay, I think I've unmuted myself. Yes, you have. Okay, thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, afternoon, everyone. I'm just referencing my notes here. I'm not gonna read all of them, but I just wanna feature the highlights and of course address any questions. Um, what is exciting is that we continue to move clients in. So um, we've been very busy. We've had to adjust our policies and procedures and interacting with clients and residents, as you might imagine, and landlords as well. Um, we're in the next month, we're looking to house another 20 homeless families. So we're um, very excited to keep that progress going. Um, last month, we launched our young, uh, youth and young, young adults program. You may have heard of this previously called TAY program, transition age youth, but the youth and young adults is the more appropriate, uh, the correct uh, reference now they're using for this uh, particular age group, which is the 18 to 25 year olds. So we had our first move in um, this last month of that program and we're hoping to house at least 40 uh, of this demographic uh, over the course of the next year. I'm excited to kick that off. Um, uh, other highlights had to launch a, an emergency fund, much like some other organizations have had to during the onset. I'm unstable, it says. Um, the onset of COVID-19, so hopefully you can still hear me. Yep. And um, in addition, uh, as you might imagine, you know, we've, we've with our demographics of our volunteers, many of them are older, um, which and obviously affects the shelter in place. So we've had staff really have had to put in a lot of extra time um, to engage and interact with our clients at all levels and make sure that they're feeling comfortable and not isolated and just with the kids making a plan for the students and um, you know as our staff trying to make sure that everyone has what they need for online learning just a lot of things going on and um, you know making sure that we're connecting resources for food etc 
um, a large percentage of our demographics are disabled. So we have to make sure that we can um, creatively get them the resources they need food wise. So that has taken up, that was sort of our initial response was making sure that we adjusted to all that shelter in place, um, all the things that, that were affected by that. So um, the other big thing that we uh, were extending our probation housing program, and for those who are unaware of that, it basically provides services uh, to, uh, services to individuals that are on felony probation under AB 109 and general supervision who are re-entering the community throughout the county. Um, we do anticipate seeing an influx very soon and we're trying to be aware of, we're actually hiring staff to, uh, to, to anticipating that to happen because, um, and I don't have all the exact stats and about when and where things are happening, but we do know that there's gonna be some releases coming up soon so we want to make sure that we can, um, you know, support that group um, with our rapid rehousing. Um, other than that, in terms of our regular donation, uh, biggest needs right now, we've put together, and this would be most significant for your faith communities if people are able to get out or they're doing online shopping and, you know, in response to shelter in place, staying put. Um, we created some opportunities that we definitely need help with. Um, one of which is care packages for people who perhaps become care, uh, COVID positive. So um, I'm not gonna go through that list, but I have a list available if people wanna help with that. Um, we also have furnishing requests out for April. And um, the last big thing is uh, we're really trying hard, and this is really tricky, but Given that the school year has, um, the in-person schooling has ended and we're now working remotely with, with the youth, um, we're looking for activity kits to support the kids at home um, of all different ages. So we put together an Amazon wish list um, for people who are looking to help support uh, creation of those kits, kind of in the vein, same vein, those of you who are familiar with our um, uh, our kits that we do, or our gifting that we do at Christmas or during the holiday season, uh, the sh season of caring, so that our kids can have different modalities to continue working from home. So it can be puzzles and paints and uh, games, et cetera. But we're finding that, you know, our folks are living in 100 square feet in many cases, and parents are trying to keep kids busy, and kids are trying to keep focused on staying inside and <laughs> um, trying to, you know, keep the mental health, et cetera, going. So um, if anyone is interested in these kits, that's a, a high need for us right now. I know I went through a lot, a lot of th my things at home and found a lot of things that were very gently used um, that I dropped by the office or even unused um, as well. So they don't have to be online, but we recognize the shelter in place. People shouldn't be going out and toy stores are not essential stores or essential services. So. Um, Lakeshore Learning Center is still doing online sales. So um, those are, that's another big high need area. And I think that is the bulk of it. Um, There's so, a few yeah. notes for you in the chat box there, Carrie. Okay, I'll look now. Okay, thank you, Scott. I see your note. And uh, one other thing is, you know, we pers as Hope Solutions has received requests about how we're managing food and we're just directing people to those that do it best. So there are, you know, including Monument Crisis Center and the food bank, et cetera. Our biggest challenge is if people can't pick it up, we're trying to coordinate people to do uh, uh, pickups and drop-offs, uh, uh, porch pickups and drop-offs. So is there any other questions? Sorry, I tried not to be short, but I don't think I, I have was. one. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm just curious whether you anticipate needing um, any policy or advocacy support around the um, anticipated influx of people coming out of prison and jail and, and, needing, um, and needing kind of emergency housing. Any advocacy support? Yeah, um, if, there's a, if there's a policy component of that, if, if um, in, in addition to obviously your, your important programmatic work. 
Um, you know what? That's a great question. I'm not sure at this time. I would actually love to check with our um, with our programs department and see if there's an element that they would um, seek assistance on. Could I connect you offline? Yes, absolutely. I'll put my email in the chat. That would be great. Thank you for, for that, Alex. Sure. All righty. Well, thanks so much, Carrie. Yep. Um, so in the meantime, if you want to go to the chat box, there's some activity going on there. Um, be sure to go in and, and, uh, and you know, connect with folks. Uh, now we have the Cobia home match. I think Gabriella is going to give us some insight here. Hi. Yeah. So um, with home match, so one thing I'll say is that I, we were, had for a while, we didn't have a director for Contra Costa County for a couple of months. Um, I joined in, in January and since January, we've actually had five matches. Um, be before the shelter in place started. So that was really exciting. Um, since the shelter in place started, we are not actively facilitating matches at this point, just for the safety of our applicants and participants. Um, but we are taking home seeker applications and home provider applications. Um, and so we're all working remotely, um, all the staff at Covia. So we're still getting calls in, um, we're not able to meet with clients one-on-one -on -one to do intakes, but we are doing virtual or over the phone. Um, and also we go out to the office, I do or my teammate goes once a week. And so we're sending um, paper applications to individuals that need that, that don't have access to a computer and also sending them like envelopes with stamps on them. Um, yeah, so that's kind of what we have going on. We're doing check-ins with all of our matches um, right now. What we're seeing is more just kind of doing some mediation just because from our matches that we do have, um, you know, just making sure that if there's any concerns about COVID-19 um, or if anybody's leaving the home to work, we're just making sure we're checking in with them, uh, seeing what they need. So do you have a lot more requests for, I mean, housing needs than uh, available housing or what about, what are the numbers? Uh, can you give us a little... Inside yeah, that. sure. So, well, right now we have 76 active seekers, um, but since the shelter in place started, we've really only had three or four seekers join the program. Um, we're getting a lot less calls than we did before. Um, before the uh, shelter in place started, in terms of home providers, right now we have 13 home providers. We do have two home providers that recently reached out to us, um, but it our sense when we spoke to active participants, we checked in with each one of them and even applicants that were pending in our program. And each one of them said, when we told them, we're like, we're you know putting a hold on actively facilitating matches. Each one of them was like, yes, no, I don't want to um, be meeting with anybody right now. Um, so we're not really getting a lot of intakes happening. However, we still have some going on. Okay. Right. Anybody have questions? Yeah, I can definitely see how this is going to be on hold for a little bit because of uh, this current situation. You know, nobody wants to open their homes to uh, a stranger. Um, yeah, I mean, our hope is that, so our hope is that by May, we're able to start matching individuals. Um, even if they can't physically meet in person, we at least will be having them talk over the phone, seeing if they're open to that. Um, if we need to be a part of that, doing video conferencing with them, that's what we're thinking of. What's your biggest need right now? Or what do you foresee to be the biggest need? Housing providers? Housing providers, yes. Yeah. Our concern, we're, we're creating right now kind of a different scenario plans in terms of what are the concerns providers are going to be having? Is it because the hold on evictions or like what questions do they have? So we're working with senior legal services um, to make sure that we have, you know, kind of like pamphlets put together to just answer questions to home providers if they have any. Um, a lot of the, in Contra Costa County, a lot of our home providers are be over 80. A lot of them are in their 90s. Um, so I know they're, a little just nervous in general um, to opening their homes back up, especially after this. 
Sure, sure. Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, Alex Epo. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I hope to be able to give you a rundown on a couple of things that um, have been going on at East Bay Housing Organizations. Um, the first thing I wanted to make sure folks knew about, if you haven't heard already, um, I'm, I'm sort of, as you probably can tell, I'm new to this space, and I've been kind of standing in um, for our program director, Reverend Sophia DeWitt, um, who um, has had to take a lot of leave recently um, while caring for um, a mother who was um, aging and in hospice care. Her mom passed um, at the end of last week. Um, so Sophia is, is now in mourning and um, I'm sure would, you know, if any of you have worked with her in the past, I'm sure she would welcome um, a letter or a note of condolence. And I'm, I'm going to put her um, email in the chat just now. So that's the first thing. A um, couple things which Jan asked me to cover. Um, some folks may have seen that um, EBHO has been looking to start something that we're calling Action Fridays. And um, the idea is basically to have a, um, a designated date once per month on a Friday um, where we would engage with um, people from across the range of our membership in more sort of like mass mobilization style activities. Um, so our first planned one was to go um, do signature collecting for schools and communities first at the farmer's market outside our office. Um, that had the kibosh put on it by the coronavirus. Um, so we're still kind of, a, a kind of a, a adap adapting to the new context as we all are in terms of what um, member organizing looks like um, with sheltering in place. We were able to hold um, a digital one last week um, where we had members um, sending an email to um, uh, local East Bay congressional delegates, including um, Barbara Lee, in order to try to work on Speaker Pelosi to make sure that she is doing the most that she possibly can to include um, maximal resources for housing and homelessness um, in, the, in all the future COVID response bills at the federal level, um, including the main thing that we've been tracking recently, which is a proposed, a democratic proposal for $100 billion in emergency rental assistance. Um, when I get through with this, I can, I'll put, um, some links in the chat if you're interested in, in signing up for the next Action Friday in May um, or interested in, in signing up for EBHO's emails in general in which all of this will be announced. The next thing is that um, every year EBHO holds Affordable Housing Week at the beginning of May. Um, obviously that's been disrupted um, along with everything else. Um, I did find out that we are going to be moving our um, annual kickoff um, event to the virtual space. So that's gonna take place on the evening of May 7th. Um, I don't have the time yet, um, but if you, again, if you sign up for our email, um, emails, if you don't get those already, you'll get all the details. Um, and at that, we're gonna be honoring our um, selected honorees, which includes Monument Impact um, from Contra Costa. Um, there's gonna be some other virtual events that happen that week, um, but we're still trying to firm them up. So if you sign up for email, um, email updates, then you'll, you know, you'll, you'll um, get the news as soon as I do probably. Um, the main thing that we have been working on from a policy perspective recently has been emergency coronavirus response and especially um, uh, eviction moratoria. Um, so I shared those, e those links in the chats, uh, in the chat, excuse me. Um, I th think that the thing that might be particularly interesting to folks is the second link which is to a matrix or a table that basically lists all of the local and county ordinances that exist in um, the East Bay at the moment and kind of compares and contrasts them in terms of um, their parameters. And, um, you know, some are obviously much stronger than others in terms of the protections they provide. Um, I will say that we are, you know, we've been concerned, but not entirely surprised by the relative lack of action in Contra Costa versus Alameda County. Um, we're definitely gonna be um, involved in pushing for a countywide moratorium tomorrow and beyond. Um, I'm not positive personally about whether the proposed countywide moratorium is going to cover all of the cities uh, in Contra Costa County as Alameda County's does. Um, under kind of 
counties have emergency authorities in California to be able to pass laws that don't only apply to unincorporated areas, but also cover all the cities in their jurisdictions. So it would be ideal if Contra Costa's moratorium does that in order to cover all of these cities that don't have a local ordinance. Um, but if there is a movement afoot in order to try to pass local ordinances, um, especially in places with larger numbers of renters like Walnut Creek, we would be interested in collaborating on that. Um, the last thing I'll say is Jan had asked about um, what sorts of uh, state level bills we're tracking. Um, as I'm sure you can imagine, the legislative process is deeply uncertain right now. Um, the legislature is in um, suspension for the moment and we don't know yet when it will resume, how many bills individual members will be allowed to sponsor and what the budget picture and therefore directives will look like. Um, so one of the things that we're hearing is that members of the legislature um, may need to move from the, the strategy of advancing new bills with that create new spending priorities to actually going into a more defensive stance in order to protect existing spending priorities. Um, one of the perhaps only exceptions, I think good for us, um, will be around housing and homelessness bills so long as they don't inflate the budget and, and um, have some kind of clear nexus to the coronavirus, which many of them obviously do. Um, that said, we still don't know for certain which bills will be viable and active once the legislature resumes. Um, I will say in closing that um, I was on a call which um, some people may have been on last Friday organized by um, Housing California and the Corporation for Supportive Housing um, in which David Chu said that he still plans to advance some of his um, homelessness focused bills. Um, I think a big one is AB 1905, um, which would create an estimated 500 million in new funding for homelessness services and, and housing first programs um, by changing the mortgage interest deduction on um, expensive homes and on second homes. And the other one is AB 2329, which would do a conduct a statewide needs and gaps analysis in order to bring some um, kind of clarity to what sorts of programs are working and what sorts of programs need to be rolled out. And he said that he wants to hear from advocates like the people on this call about what we all feel is most urgent right now. Um, so I'd encourage everyone to take that invitation seriously. And the last thing I'll say is that um, at the last meeting, uh, multi-faith action coalition meeting that I was at last month, we voted to sign on to a, a, um, a $2 billion budget ask letter, um, which the group approved. Um, this would be creating an ongoing annual um, funding source for um, uh, housing and homelessness kind of continuum programs. And I just learned this morning that um, there is now a, a legislative bill, AB 3300, that is basically translated what we had in the letter into, um, into a legislative um, action item. Um, so uh, at EPO, we're just getting up to speed with this, um, with this new item. I'm assuming that we will be um, fully supporting that and I think that this group might, might wanna consider doing the same. Wow. Yes, if I might re respond to that, um, Alex, I also found um, that bill, AB 3300, and uh, and noted its um, tracking of the of the asks of that budget ask letter that we signed. Um, and uh, by the way, um, I did submit our multi faith action coalition support to um, the contact person from the corporation for uh, supportive housing, which is Sharon Rapport, and uh, she replied and uh, uh, thanked me for adding our support. So presumably in future use of that letter, our support would be also indicated. Uh, but as far as that AB 3300 uh, bill is concerned, uh, I do think we should take a look at that and uh, it's that could be something for our next meeting. Okay, uh, let's see, Sheltering, who is gonna do the update, Julie or Elizabeth? It's gonna be Julie today since she's joining us. Okay. Julie, you're on mute. Perfect.
Thank you. Great to be with you all today. Um, as uh, every other uh, provider, we've had to pivot in how we provide our services, um, but continue to serve our vulnerable um, constituents. So, um, of course, we are all working remotely unless you have a private office like this one and get to come in every once in a while where it's quiet and you don't have dogs barking in the background. Um, we are, the biggest changes that we've seen is that, of course, because of the shelter in place, um, we can no longer have groups come in and provide meals at our shelters. And in particular, at the Mountain View Family Shelter, that was provided 365 days a year. So we've seen a uh, sharp increase in our expenses for providing meals for those families. Um, we've had some creativity around that where folks have paid for um, caterers who are also out of work at this time to actually do catering and bring in meals um, to us uh, so that they can still keep appropriate social distancing um, guidelines um, and have people just funding food so that we can purchase the food to cook at the shelter. Um, so that's an ongoing need. Uh, we've also, um, as a result of our great partnership with the county, H3, been able to uh, be one of the motel providers, um, be the operator of that, I should say. Um, and the biggest expansion has been in our prevention programs, which has also been through the county and our really generous funder, Tipping Point, who's um, trying to help our most vulnerable um, at-risk clients so that they don't become homeless. Um, so we've expanded our prevention team by doubling it. Um, and even on Friday, we had 150 incoming calls Friday alone for people seeking assistance. So it's um, the economic impact is being demonstrated, um, is being lived out by our the folks that we've been serving anyway. Um, and now some of those are even more vulnerable and we have new vulnerable populations. So um, we continue to work daily and our case management is happening, happening remotely. Um, the, the, we're also trying to have uh, sewing groups make masks so that our participants can have masks um, because we all know what that shortage has looked like. Um, so a few people are stepping up and making some homemade masks that at least our clients, if they can get out for groceries, can um, be protected. Um, I'm very interested, Alex, in what's going on with our funding for uh, our, like our AB 109 program. I'm not sure that the money is following the release of the nonviolent offenders who've been released. Um, and so that's a, a long-term strategy that I'm not sure ever that has been thought through and actually had money put behind it. Um, but it's new, so we'll just like everyone else earlier, it's like every half a day, every couple of hours, things change. So we'll be keeping our ear to the ground there. Um, so we're seeking more resources to help more of our uh, vulnerable neighbors uh, financially with food, uh, we too have had to, uh, in our new prevention program in particular, are really um, broadening or ma making our requirements more flexible so that those uh, needs can be met at this very difficult time. Questions? So did, did you have, was there an existing source of money attached to AB 109 releases to help rehouse people? And has there been any talk about um, using that existing channel in order to um, move new resources to support more releases? Not so far. And what I've only heard secondhand last week actually was that uh, our program director for that program was being warned that we may have less money coming mm -hmm. down the pike towards us for that program. And um, if they're releasing more people um, who are not going to have that built-in support network, we certainly want to be able to to help them and keep them from becoming, you know, on becoming homeless on the streets. So if uh, I'm going to, I chatted in, but he's in another meeting right now, our um, 
our reentry director to see what's going on um, funding wise, but I, I'll definitely be in touch with you, Alex. Okay, great. And, and just to flag it for later, one other thing that'd be great to talk about is whether you're concerned about uh, existing um, kind of blanket bans on people, on formerly incarcerated people, and just how the, the increase in need is interacting with all the existing mechanisms of discrimination okay. um, in the absence of a fair chance housing policy in most of these jurisdictions. So yes, that'd be great yeah. to talk. Great. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Um, Trinity Center with Leslie. Hi, much of what I would share would be um, repetitive of what everybody else has been saying, but Trinity Center is still open for business. Um, our normal hours providing our normal basic services. Um, we too have had uh, volunteers need to stay home, which means the staff who are here are doing more, um, but we're getting super support from providers and contributors um, and local businesses who are really stepping up to help. Um, our member advocacy goes on, but on a more limited scale. Um, and it's mostly around addressing, um, you know, making sure everything is staying safe in the building and then helping people get connected to resources externally. Um, our evening program came to a close at its normally scheduled time, which was uh, the last night was Thursday, March 26th. Um, and everything closed out well with that. The county was able to help um, give some people an extended stay while a few more were able to find housing. So that was great. Um, but as you know, we couldn't continue it in the armory because the uh, National Guard was uh, activated. So they needed the armory back. But we were really fortunate that we didn't even have to lose one evening of the evening program. Um, our day program is seeing actually increasing numbers of people, about 50% more um, unduplicated people than we typically see in a week. And it's been an interesting combination of old members who are uh, in need again and coming back to us because they know that they can count on us for help and new people who were um, kind of the hidden homeless that we all know are out there the people who were showering in gyms and hanging out in mcdonald's and those places are not available to them anymore so they're coming here for showers meals laundry that sort of thing um, safe parking as you know is continuing on and we're working hard to try and be able to continue that um, and we are still needing to do all the normal things. So our gala, which was scheduled for May 8th, is now going to be an online gala the evening of May 8th. And our in-person one is going to, has been rescheduled for late October. Um, we were finding that as members were getting housed, some of the post office change of address stuff was getting all wonky. So we've now started up our own PO box for our business mail. So we're going to start to publicize that for our business nail. Um, and all of that is in anticipation of moving back into our new space, which even in the middle of all of this is actually going to happen. Um, maybe end of the month, maybe early May, that's kind of on the quiet, so don't spread that broadly. Um, but uh, the work is continuing. The only hold up right now is still the kitchen, but everything else is looking great. And we're making our moving plans and we're waiting for inspection. So we will be back there oh uh, let's guess within the within a month from now but we'll see um and it looks beautiful um, of course we now need to look at that space through the covid and and germ reduction lens but nevertheless we're looking forward to being back in there um, but one of the things that means us moving back there is that we will not have um, the luxury of space that we've had here at 1300 boulevard way so honestly a need that we have right now is a place to store our mats and our cots and the bins and stuff that were used for the evening program. We're just not going to have enough space to do that when we go back to um, 1888 Trinity Ave. So if anybody knows of some space or has some space that things could literally sit for eight months until we need them again, that would be really helpful. Um, and then finally, on another piece of good news, um, these folks, I don't know if you can see it. Nope, oh, there we go. Let's try that way. Exchange Community Church, they are now doing for um, the next five Thursdays from 12 to one, they're doing a hot meal program um, out of a mobile van parked in the parking lot of Walnut Creek Presbyterian Church. So if you come across anybody or you know anybody who's in the general Walnut Creek area, 
and needs a hot meal. They can do individuals, they can do families, but the kids have to come too. Um, and then it's a hot meal to go and it's in the parking lot, but you can't see it from either Trinity Ave or Locasi Ave. You have to literally go into the Walnut Creek Prez parking lot um, to see the van, but that's a resource for the next five weeks. So, and I don't know if any of you know Exchange Community Church. I didn't until now, but I've met the, the woman who's heading that up and it's, it's really a great thing that they're doing. So maybe there's someone we want to invite to be part of multi-faith action. So that's it from Trinity Center. Thank you, Leslie. Uh, Judy, do you have anything to add for Winter Nights? Well, yeah, um, uh, we are still open and we have right now, we have um, three families, but two weeks ago, three weeks ago, we started with um, six families and Two of, and we're not taking any more uh, families, but we are sheltering in place. And our um, uh, and we had to uh, tell all the volunteers not to come, so that meant no evening meals. And um, so we're doing restaurants. And right now they're at Mount Diablo UU Church, and they'll be there until. Uh, the end of April, a little bit into May, and then we anticipate closing. The three families that we have left, two of them are working with housing agencies. One of them was Shelter Inc. told them they would have a housing in December, and they still don't have it. So you two Shelter Inc. people, if you could do anything about that, <laughs> help this family out. Um, the, uh, and the other one is a woman who has cancer and she's, she's waiting for uh, to be um, get permanent supportive housing. And um, so that should work out fairly soon. And the last one is a family that may not be able to get housing. So if anybody knows of a motel um, or if have a motel that we can put this family in, please let me know. Um, but so far we're doing, we're doing fine and, um, our, our staff is being kind of overworked somewhat like everybody else's because we don't have any volunteers, but a lot of folks have stepped up and provided artwork and games and that sort of thing. And, um, we'll hope to maybe get a few of those put together and send them over to, uh, Hope Solutions. But I, I think that's all, except we are working on maybe standard parking program. All right, thank you, Judy. Uh, is anybody here for an update on Habitat for Humanity? I got a note from Karen this morning and I will send out, she had sent me an email fairly recently and I will uh, pick and choose and you know summarize that and send that out to folks. And encourage those of you who have given, um, um, sharing today, if you can give me a, a, a summary write-up, particularly with links and contacts and info. We need to move quickly to uh, Doug and his legislation, I think. All righty. Doug. Scott has, Scott has a, a quick update. Yeah, I just wanted to mention I um, met with a, a Pleasant Hill City building inspector. He came out to my site inspected it, said it would be really easy to do what we're trying to accomplish through nomadic communities uh, on site, made a few suggestions, threw one wrench in that uh, City of Pleasant Hill requires, can't remember if it's 76 or 74 square foot, square feet per person habitating, and the shelters I was looking at were eight by eight foot, which are only 64 square feet, of course, and so um, they do make another one, it's a company called Pallet Shelter, um, they're being used quite a bit. There's a whole village set up in Sonoma by them. And uh, they do make another unit that's eight by 10 foot, but it runs in the neighborhood of $10,000. And so um, I know the next steps for me now after meeting with the inspector is we have to, um, it would be advantageous for us to put in a, um, a, a dedicated 20 amp circuit for each client that we plan on housing in these shelters on site. and um, 
a sewage clean out um, connection uh, where we can either connect portable showers um, and porta potties. Well, we wouldn't connect the porta potty to it, but the portable shower for the gray water. But then I had the homeless man that's been living in my um, parking lot in his truck um, and attending our church. He uh, got a line on a really nice 24 foot drivable RV. So he works full time. This is the classic case, right? He works full time in Contra Costa County as a construction worker making good money. Um, but he, he can't afford rent on a house, obviously, even with that job. And so he's gone. I rarely see him. He's working full time plus hours, but he has money saved up. So he bought this RV and it's a 24 foot unit and has parked it on site where I plan on uh, installing those nomadic communities. And I only did that after I talked to Ken Carlson, the former mayor of Pleasant Hill. Um, we were texting back and forth and I said, what do you think um, about this? Um, I don't want to get myself in trouble or anything. And Ken just immediately said, do it. Uh, no one's going to complain. And if they do, especially right now, you're not going to have, you know, the police aren't going to really be doing anything with the city. Um, you have this in writing because we're texting, so do it. And so I did. I gave the guy the okay. And he parked his RV about two weeks ago in the site um, alongside my building. And I haven't had a single neighbor complaint. And I actually had a neighbor realized he was back there and brought him bags of groceries one day. <laughs> and so that's been pretty interesting. And so it's really made me think, well, if I've got to pay $10,000 for a shelter that is really a crude, you know, serviceable, but crude shelter, you know, I can buy a lot of uh, 24 foot ish um, travel trailers that are in really nice shape for 10 to $15,000 and they get a real bed, they get a real toilet, they get a real shower, cooking, everything. Um, and if I have these clean outs on the side of the building um, that are to code and 20 amp dedicated circuits for them, which is overkill, but you know, to code done there, um, you know, they could even hook up to the water supply and um, they'd have full, you know, full utilities there. Um, so that's what we're kind of moving, the direction we're kind of moving in right now. Um, but right now, I think for the next phase for us, while this gentleman lives on the side of the alley, is to um, install these electrical outlets, the electrical circuits, and the um, sewage clean out so we can kind of prove to the city, um, you know, that that was being done well. That's what the building inspector recommended if he wanted. He said if I wanted to streamline it. So again, the idea is to put two shelters in place with full facility access for cooking or bathrooms or showers, do it at minimal to no cost to, you know, needing funds from the city or anything, how um, financing that all through uh, the church that I'm uh, pastoring at. And they're all waiting and keep asking me every week, why aren't we doing this yet? <laughs> so that's been fun too. And um, yeah, so, and then just trying to uh, get that in place and then casework them uh, along the way, give them a one year stay. If we bought the RVs, um, if we go to a travel trailer kind of idea, you know, they just buy them and non op them and, uh, and just connect them up to utilities and people would have a one year stay in them. And, uh, then they would hopefully be, um, connected to housing at the, at the end or before that of the one year plan. So that's kind of my status right now. All right. Thanks, Scott. Sounds Sounds good. I think that travel trailer sounds much better from what you yeah. said. Yeah. All right, Doug, I think you're up with proposed housing legislation. Yes. And so I want to go back to uh, what Alex brought up earlier about this, um, um, this new bill, AB 3300, that is uh, very closely aligned with the budget request letter that Multi-Faith Action Coalition has already signed. Um, I do believe that is a more urgent um, bill, but since we haven't had a chance to send around any information about it, and I think we have time since the legislature is not even in session until May 4th, um, that it would make more sense to me that we wait until our next uh, task force meeting to consider that bill. And in the meantime, we can circulate a fact sheet and some other information about that new bill. And so if everybody, everybody accepts that premise, uh, 
uh, we can go and talk about these other bills that we did circulate some information about uh, pre previous to this meeting. Is that all right? Sounds good. Okay, so um, the two bills that um, we that Jan sent information about um, at my request are Senate Bill 899 um, by Senator Scott Weiner on uh, faith-based uh, organizations building affordable housing and uh, a bill that has nothing at all to do with housing and shelter. Uh, it's AB uh, 3073 uh, and it's a bill to provide uh, pre-release signups for CalFresh for people who are uh, incarcerated so that people can, upon release from uh, prison or jail, uh, could um, be immediately start receiving CalFresh benefits, food stamps. Um, so the reason for including that bill in our discussion today is that um, Multi-Faith Action Coalition uh, at the steering committee level has been doing some strategic planning and has been talking about the benefits of uh, organizing um, along the lines of some kind of a campaign or campaigns. And um, um, the, the idea is that um, if we find a bill that we think is appropriate for a campaign, that would mean something that we really think we can get people in our congregations interested in and excited about um, and to take individual actions uh, from, from, um, from various congregations, uh, that, that that would be, be something that we, we really think would help to um, you know, invigorate uh, the uh, involvement of people in our congregations about uh, state legislative advocacy. Well, actually, um, any any kind of advocacy uh, it doesn't have to be state legislation. But if we have a campaign that really speaks to people's basic core values, um, then people can get excited about it. So these two pieces of state legislation are, are, seem to be um, candidates for that type of of uh, campaign. And so we were discussing these at the steering committee level um, as potential campaign um, bills. But since this is a, since AB 899 is a housing bill, the uh, steering committee doesn't want to go any further with that, that and, unless it's actually endorsed by the Housing and Shelter Task Force. So uh, for the benefit of anybody who hasn't um, had a chance to uh, look at the materials that were sent around, uh, I think it was just um, a, a, fact, a fact sheet which did not actually have the bill number on it, AB or SB 899. Um, it's a one page fact sheet that has the logos of two sponsoring organizations, the Nonprofit Housing Association of Northern California and the Southern California Association of Nonprofit Housing. Uh, it's titled Allowing Places of Worship and Hospitals to Build Affordable Housing. And um, if you've seen that, great. If not, and if everybody's uh, agreeable with it, I, I could just read three short paragraphs from that sheet. Shall I go ahead with that? Yes. I'm seeing some. Uh, yeah, some go, go for it, Doug. And then hopefully we can all get a, get a, a consensus to support it before we uh, end the meeting. Right. So uh, on that sheet, two paragraphs under the title proposal first. And here, here goes the quotations. The legislature is looking to streamline the building process for faith-based institutions and nonprofit hospitals that want to build affordable housing by allowing them to build 100% multifamily affordable housing units, parenthesis, targeted at 80% of area median income and below, in parens, uh, regardless of local zoning restrictions, this proposed legislation would override local zoning restrictions. These religious institutions and nonprofit hospitals would partner with affordable housing developers and agree to maintain the affordability of these homes for at least 55 years for rental housing and 45 years for home ownership opportunities. 
Depending on the location of the property and proximity to major roads and commercial zones, religious organizations and nonprofit hospitals would be able to build between 40 to 150 new affordable homes without undergoing costly and time intensive rezoning. Then just the first paragraph, short paragraph under benefits. This legislation would make building affordable housing easier, faster, and cheaper for faith-based institutions and nonprofit hospitals that want to build affordable housing. Many of these are already community anchors, and this would help them build stable, safe, affordable housing for local residents and families and open doors to high resource neighborhoods. So that's, that's the, the kernel of the fact sheet that we sent around. I do want to point out that um, one of the things we usually talk about when we're um, when we're um, uh, discussing uh, legislative um, uh, bills is who supports and who's against. I already mentioned the two co-sponsors here, but EBHO is, is um, signed up as a supporter of this bill as well. Um, and uh, if you're wondering about opposition, note what it says about local zoning ordinances would be um, preempted, basically. So you can count on uh, opposition from um, municipalities, cities, you know, other jurisdictions who really want to maintain local control. That's always the fight with, uh, um, you know, housing bills that, that try to streamline things is the loss of local control. So that's the, that's the bill in a nutshell. And um, so I would propose, I make a motion that um, the, the um, Housing and Shelter Task Force recommend to the steering committee that Multi-Faith Action Coalition take a position in support of this bill. And I second that. Yeah. So we can have some more discussion now if everybody wants to. If there's anybody opposed to this, um, please speak up. If nobody speaks up, I assume that the motion is carried. Or we can vote by doing this. Mm -hmm. You want to you want to do a hand vote? There's no questions. I actually I have a question. Yeah. yeah. Might there be any um, any complication around what is or isn't described as qualifying as a faith-based organization? I haven't heard of it. And I don't know the answer to that. Alex, do you know? Um, can you say more about the scenario that you're imagining? Um, not exactly, but uh, like what would qualify or not qualify as a faith-based organization for the purposes of this? Um, is that me, defined that somewhere? Down. I just haven't read the whole bill. I can, um, I can look up the language okay. of the legislation right okay. now. Just I'm sure it's fine, as long as it's in there. <laughs> it's in there, yeah. Great, thank you. I'm, I'm wondering if there's any anything defining where the land is. Is, is it adjacent to the face-based organization or hospital? And is, is there anything in the bill that indicates that there would be some limit on where the land is that these institutions are making available? That might yeah. help with the local control. Yes, sure they have, is. So yeah, they have a fourth of an acre or larger, or either adjacent to an arterial road or within a fourth mile of a central business district. So they, some of the neighborhoods where there are churches, that they wouldn't be eligible because of their location. They want them to have access to services and things. There are some height limits. Um, mm. But um, I haven't. But those are all zoning things that this is overriding. Well, no, they still have something in there in terms of if you have up to 40 units or something, it can only be 36. And if it's, uh, uh, you can't have more than 150, no more than 55 feet. So it's, they have a few parameters. Mm -hmm. It just says that you're not, you don't have to go through all the, the regular uh, process. You have a by right mm. uh, process. 
So if I if I could uh, try answering Leslie's question, I did look up the language, and it does have a section of um, the bill does have a section of definitions, and in it there's a definition of a religious institution. It says religious institution means an institution owned, controlled, and operated and maintained by a bona fide church, religious denomination, or a religious organization composed of blah 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 blah. I mean, there, anyway, there's a there's a definition in there. Okay, it sounds like the, I don't see any opposition from anybody. So I think you can take it back to the steering committee, Doug. As, okay. Uh, and, well, uh, why don't you have a vote? <laughs> yeah, you should have a vote. Yeah. Yes. All right, well, we, you still can't see everybody, I don't think. Well, but, you can. Uh, I can, can yeah, your, we can. We can see Get your hand in the picture. I can see everybody can but you, Jeanette. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we can see your hands. Okay. Unanimous. All right. Pretty clear. This should help some someplace like Clayton Valley Presbyterian. Okay. Jamie's right. video just came on briefly with her hand held up as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, hi, Jamie. <laughs> All right. Well, okay. thank you, everybody. We actually are um, getting to the two minute mark two for our meeting. Okay. And, and, I, and I need to leave. So thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you all. Um, 